the past three days together. So Nick and Robert are coming in right now. We're here, Karen. Thank you. Robert's here. Well, uh, this is the epilogue. It's going to be about half an hour, and then there's lunch. And uh, as I said um, just before coffee, an epilogue suggests a bit of a closing, but that's really not the spirit of what we're trying to do here. Um, this really is a staging post in a, in a vibrant, disruptive, chaotic, non-normal dynamic, the kind of things we've all been sampling for the last uh, 24 hours, 36 hours. <clears throat> Rich, granular discussions, but what are you all going to take away to your train, your plane, your office, your colleagues, your homes, your family? What's the message? And that's what we want to try and distill for you uh, in the next 30 minutes. So you can go home and say, at Brussels Forum, I got this clear message. Now, all of you will have your own impressions, but as you've seen, Robert and I have been sitting listening, trying to distill, trying to get a sense of what has been emerging and what the themes are. And first, I think I have to uh, ask Anne-Marie Slaughter, as Anne-Marie Slaughter mentioned in her breakfast, Robert, what do you do? Well, after hearing Anne-Marie say that, I realized that I've been as guilty as anyone in asking people those questions. And so from now on, I'm going to ask people the latest book they read or the latest uh, piece of music they listened to. But in terms of what I do, the last three years, I've been traveling back and forth to Romania uh, to do a book uh, basically about how Europe looks from the other side from the point of view of a country where World War II did not end until 1989. And get that, get, get that around your heads, where World War II did not end until 1989. For Romania, it was the long European War, 1914 to 1989, because the interwar years were chaotic, fascist, authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera. So that in, if we're talking about a world of disorder, Romania really did not know order and normality in any sense until the 1990s, after a century. And it gives Romanians, you know, the hundreds I interviewed, uh, a, a, a vision, a way of looking at Europe that's different than you get here. It's a, it's a Europe where the EU is more than a balance sheet. It's still about hope. It's about states rather than ethnic nations. It's about individual rights, not treating people on the basis of their group or their last name. It's all the things we take for granted that they take less for granted. Now, you're not here to promote your book. The aim, really, is to just bring it full circle yeah. from what we heard from Mar Margaret Macmillan right at the, at the beginning, talking about the Roman Empire, talking about what happened at the beginning of World War I, to, to create that context yeah. of history yeah. and how that is important to understand the enormity of what is happening. But I'm going to come back to the point we raised yesterday initially. Is this the right title, a world beyond disorder? Because surely what's being defined here is how the world is struggling to embrace the scale of the new non-normal, the new disorder, quite apart from what happens after that. I think it's about coping with disorder by first understanding it. And by understanding it, then you have the possibility to move beyond it. But first, you have to understand <clears throat> where it comes from. As I said yesterday, we're in a post-imperial period, a post-imperial moment, in the sense that it's harder and harder for the great powers to project power. What we have to look beyond now is the weakening of Russia, of Ch uh, Russia particularly. Um, and, even, and though it's in a far more subtle sense of China, because I feel that the more weaker internally China and Russia become, the more aggressive externally they may become. Do you think there's been a gripping of the enormity of the non-normal at the moment. We just heard from Farah Pandit, for example, ISIS is not the last stop. In other words, everyone's worried about ISIS or Daesh or whatever we want to call it. But it's the scale of what is happening, the dynamic of what is happening, and the uncertainty and the speed at which it's happening. Uh, yes, I think ISIS is the latest technological iteration of the merging of a religion distorted by digital technology um, so that 
um, so that you create like a monochrome Islam that's radical, um, that's different, that's more technologically evolved from Al Qaeda, and this will continue to happen. I was talking to the French general afterwards, and he said what they're looking forward to is a grafting of of, ra of radical groups like El like ISIS with organized crime in the future. That's already happening, but it may, but the scale of it may increase. But I'm, what I'm getting at there, I think, Robert, is the fact that ISIS was struggling with that but it's what happens next. I'm using that just as emblematic. Yeah. In other words, the enormity of so many iterations of so many issues which are coming yeah. fast down the track. And I think right here in Europe, to get back to Central Eastern Europe, what you see, and that's part of this, is the latest Russian form of imperial subversion. Uh, which is, it's, uh, I've heard over and over again, uh, again in Romania, elsewhere, that Article 5 does not protect these countries from, from the threat against them, because Article 5 is about an overt, obvious act of aggression. But what's coming from Moscow is aggression by buying media by third through third parties, buying off corrupt politicians, um, building energy pipelines to ensnare energy poor countries, to run all kinds of intelligence operations, a kind of imperialism that's ambiguous. And because it's ambiguous, it's deniable. And it, because it's deniable, it's harder for the West to formulate a response. We're all lucky to be here for 48 hours to listen to this in this kind of incubator of ideas and, and challenges. But what, what about um, the scale of what is happening and the ability to understand the enormity, the human challenge of those in leadership, for example. Now, I say that because in the 1990s, you were writing papers and pieces for The Atlantic, which you brought together in The Coming Anarchy. And I took the trouble to check the kind of things you were writing about disease, about refugee migrations, uh, and about um, nation states, the erosion of nation states and international borders. That's what you were warning about 20 years ago. That's surely what we're confronting. Yes, it is. And because of the enormity in scale, uh, I think that never before in history has leadership been so lonely. Because leaders have to listen to a drum roll of briefings from experts every day are uh, really boring down into the, you know, into, you know, into the technical details of things. And yet the leader has to step back and remain a generalist and deal with just not, you know, uh, not just the, the profundity of what's happening, but the speed of it. And, you know, and, and leadership was always about having good judgment at a time of crisis. That's something that you can't be taught or that's very hard to be taught. You know, some people People just have it. Robert Gates ha you know, has it. Uh, James Baker had it when he was Secretary of State, others. But, but it's going to require an even greater amplitude of that you know, to make this rapid fire decisions in time of crisis with, it, w uh, as Henry Kissinger used to say, you can't wait for 80 or 100 percent of the information to make a decision because by the time you have 20 or 40 percent, it, it may already be too late to make for you to affect the outcome. So it's a banner of making a decision with just partial evidence. I'm getting a few one-liners from some of you about the kind of things that are in your mind. So in the next 15 minutes, do just use the app if you want. We won't get through all of it. But if, if, if there's a great idea you'd like to put to us, just, just send it to me. But let me just keep going on that issue of leadership. We just heard from Farah again. We're not nimble enough in government. We heard from uh, General Mayer earlier. We're facing, not facing static threats anymore. And he said, we have to permanently adjust and do more. And we heard from Karina Ayouni yesterday from Morocco, we lack cutting edge leadership that can rise to the disruptive challenges, must change bureaucratic thinking, respond to fast changing and evolving situations. In other words, really strong suggestions from insiders that the mindsets 
simply cannot handle the enormity of what is happening. Yes, and that leads me to a point that our governments are too stovepiped and vertical, especially the U.S. government, because as a global power, just the scale of the U.S. government is bigger than other governments. So you have a stovepipe, vertical, deep dive of, of military, of diplomatic, of justice, the various departments in government, and what needs to evolve, pardon the expression, is more of a, more of a model along the old British colonial office, uh, where, th where, where the layers were horizontal, not vertical, where military, diplomatic, justice, et cetera, all worked in the same building, more or less, and all cross-fertilized all the time. Yet, you know, we call it colonial, but it was actually a horizontal way of making decisions. Niels Moscow has this um, thought, one-liner. How do you ensure, out of all of this, this kind of leadership challenge, uh, that strategic thinking prevails in a world that expects immediate results. Remember what the general said earlier. Yeah. You know, who remembers the 100-year war? Not 100 days yeah. or 100 hours, yeah. but a 100-year war, because that's what history tells us. Um, uh, on a dinner the other night, I remember James Steinberg telling me that you cannot read enough history. Uh, there's always more history to be read. And, you know, history is very insightful because it gives um, it, you know, it gives a context to the present. The current moment did not begin when we started to focus on it. It has a past that goes back hundreds or even thousands of years. And just focusing on, on relevant history, I wouldn't say guarantees strategic thinking, nothing can do that, but it encourages it. It moves you a little bit closer to that. What do you think the message is going out then about the capacity to embrace this new scale of non-normative disruption, which has been pretty well defined yeah. by the standards of today? But as I reminded people on the first day, this time last year, when none of us were thinking or putting on the agenda migration, officially, certainly yeah. here. And we weren't thinking six months ago about the possibility of President Trump. In other words, the ability of the systems now to think these unpalatables and unthinkables, however you want to describe them. Yes, uh, I put it this way. Who in 1900 could have predicted World War I? Who do, at the end of World War I could have predicted World War II? Who in, uh, you know, after the Cuban Missile Crisis could have predicted the Iranian Revolution? And on and on it goes. It's a matter of thinking the implausible, you know, uh, 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 of thinking... Or a presidential visit to Cuba. Yeah. Yes, yes. Or thinking in a nonlinear way. Uh, you know, thinking about discontinuities. What could happen that's not already in the, that's not just a linear extension of what's been going on. Because we all tend to, to revert to linear thinking because it's easy to, to formulate a future based on just a continuation of the trends of the present. But, but, but that often doesn't get you where, uh, uh, where you are where you need to be. So what's the message for the young professionals in here, the fast trackers who are making it in the corporate world, the startups, or wanting to go into public life? Read history and read philosophy. Because someone like Isaiah Berlin, or on another tack, uh, Thomas Hobbes, are still incredibly relevant for what's going on in Africa with ISIS, et cetera. Why is that? Because Hobbes said before you could, order comes before freedom. Because without order, there is no freedom for, it, for, uh, for anybody. And that's why, the, uh, in a way, the Americans have less to offer other people because their systems of order were inherited from 18th century England. Whereas a lot of places around the world have to reinvent legitimate systems of political order from scratch. And Isaiah Berlin always believed in, uh, you know, in the triumph or the need to preserve liberalism and not to fall into the trap of believing in totalizing ideologies. Uh, you know, he was always a voice of restraint, and I think we need that more and more. 
We had yesterday um, the budget commissioner up here, uh, Madame Gorgieva, and she was warning at one point about we have a tendency to close our eyes to things that are bad and pray that things will pass over our heads. And she then referred to it's like driving a car, always looking in the rear mirror, thinking that's the way ahead. Well, it's ironic. I'll get back to this again. But the way to look forward is to know what happened backwards. Because what is the present? It's the sum total of everything that's happened up to this point in history. And if you understand everything that's happened or much of what has happened up to this point, you're more likely to see what's in front of you. Nancy Lindbergh has just dropped this line, um, this thought, security and human rights are too often seen as a zero-sum game. Short-term urgency and public pressure result in security-focused solutions and investments, despite all evidence showing that the reduction of citizens' rights can further inflame extre extremism. How to tip the scale towards more even-handed responses? Well, I think people in the intelligence community deal with this all the time, because democratic publics are notoriously fickle. Um, they, you know, they want total revenge after a mass casualty attack. And yet, four months later, if there's not been a second attack, they say, why did you take such harsh and extreme measures? So it's, you know, it's particularly the, uh, uh, you know, the, the difficulty of people in the intelligence community and in the wider political community to thread that narrow gap between protecting people and protecting their, protecting, you know, the liberal order at the same time. I'm haunted by what Margaret Macmillan reminded us right at the beginning, and she wrote a brilliant book published last year on the start of uh, World War I, two years ago, actually. Um, but talking about that five weeks, which yeah. suddenly led to war. And I still think that both of us have been talking about this. It's chilling to listen to former Foreign Minister Ivanov sitting there yesterday, um, warning about changes, not just yeah. radical, but irreversible about this possibility, inevitability almost in his mind and his words, about this leading to a crisis like Cuba or the missile crisis yeah. of the 80s yeah. uh, in Europe. Dangers of miscalculation, misunderstanding, lack of contact, no confidence building measures, leading really to the potential of a true catastrophe, which really all of us could say could have been prevented. Is that the dilemma of the new uh, disruption? Well, we, and uncertainties. It, great, great powers and small powers throughout history have often stumbled into wars. And if I were to pick one, one region where it's easy to see stumbling into war, it's the South China Sea. Because neither side wants it. Uh, both, bo both sides seek to avoid it. But both sides are taking incremental steps closer to it. And remember, um, a war, you know, the collapse of Libya, the collapse of Syria, et cetera, you know, uh, to be a bit cynical, have not affected financial markets that much. You know, financial markets have discounted for them. But if you had a, a war uh, in the South China Sea involving, you know, some of the world's leading economies, or in the Korean Peninsula, or in the East China Sea, or between the U.S. and Russia, that would unravel, you know, you know that could really uh, unravel the, the global financial system. But Robert, it's about the process that he was indicating could lead to something like this, that really there is no confidence of even contact between NATO and Moscow. I mean, that's going back to the dark ages. Well, I don't know if there's no contact. I think the Obama administration's in constant contact uh, with the Russians at this moment. The question is, what is the quality of that content? Are they, you know, are they just lecturing each other, or is there a real back-channel exchange of, you know, e you know, exchange of views that, and, and ways of deconflicting things? Just before I ask Robert for his last thought, has anyone got one theme that they'd like to put on the agenda, which we maybe haven't uh, uh, in any way raised? There are three hands going up. Remember that neither Robert nor I have any responsibility for any policy. Just give us, in 30 seconds, one thought, please, and the microphone there and the microphone here. Is the man asking a question? Don't you think that one of the most important things we face now is the lack of trust in government? And don't you think that that's what has to be restored 
not only here in Europe, but in the United States? Uh, yes. What, you know, we're living during an age of populist anxiety. I, I recently spent a month driving across the United States just listening to people in small and medium-sized towns. And what I noticed visually was very stark. The economists are right. The American middle class really is dissolving. There's a smaller, uh, a smaller number who are drifting upwards into the upper middle, uh, wine-sipping, global co cosmopolitan class like everyone here, but a much larger number that are slipping down into a, into a lower class, near poverty, uh, you know, existence where there's no protection, you know, too little health care, no pensions, um, and they're scared and they're, and they're angry. And I think that's what's fueling populism in the United States. And I don't think you could disaggregate completely the populism in the U.S., at, you know, to, to it in, in, in Britain under Jeremy Corbyn, in Hungary under Viktor Orban, um, and on and on it goes. That, you know, there's this sense of resentment, you know, of, real, of, of real resentment where people are willing to do away with the niceties, the classiness, the, uh, you, you know, the politeness of normal politics. What about that tension, though, highlighted by the trade representative yesterday and the discussion with Google and everything else? The amazing potential for technology, and we heard it from James with all the stuff from the yeah. McKinsey Global Institute, yet the real backlash from the workers who feel their jobs are threatened uh, and in this environment feeling that their, their, their future and their prospects are bad. This built intention, which comes down to the leadership problem. Leaders are meant to handle this. Yeah. I think that, first of all, technology, as some of those panels said, are going to do a lot of wonderful, great things. For instance, even in Europe, it's going to lead to greater cities and city-states with um, real identities like in the feudal era. You're going to have a Europe of city-states and region-states that's going to partially be able to pick up the slack from the European Union, and that's going to be energized to a significant degree by technology. But technology is value neutral. Neutral, as I said yesterday. It, it can be used by terrorist organizations, others, to create not just a monochrome radical Islam, but like in the 1990s and earlier, a, a monochrome uh, radical Hinduism that, you know, that energized the Hindu nationalist movement, for instance. All that would not have been possible without the current age of technology. What is terrorism? It's this form of, it's a particular form of violence during this age and this technological age of history. All right, a question there about leadership. One more there and one here, please. Teresa Vallon, European Institute for Asian Studies. It's fascinating that in 1993, uh, Samuel Huntington wrote The Clash of Civilizations, which touches on two of the things that you mentioned right now, the South China Sea and yeah. the youth bubble in um, the Muslim world. And he predicted this in 1993, yet we're still stumbling through all of this. But we, has, we have a new aspect of ambiguity because we have China you know, kind of doing salami slicing in the South China Sea and the U.S. doesn't know how to respond. And we so have, the theme is? And the theme is these three issues of ambiguity, disorder, and how this is all going to work out between Russia, China, and at the time this distraction of the Muslim world and all of these issues that are kind of creating three different I, I pillars. Think. Thank you. Okay, so the world's always been like that, but is it much worse now? Well, actually, when you read not the article, but the full book that came after of Samuel Huntington, the, the uh, Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, his main theme was that the Clash of Civilizations was merely a stage towards the weakening of the West, that the West itself was facing a crisis, and the clash of civilizations was merely the, uh, um, um, the stage in it. And one of the things he predicted in the book was the rise of media all over the world that would reflect people, you know, local values the same way that Fox News or, you know, MSNBC reflected American parochial values. And that, that all that all came true. Uh, there is, um, I, it's it's not so much a clash of civilizations. I call it the clash of artificially reconstructed civilizations. Because what's happened is, as globalization has created a mass cosmopolitanism, specific 
you know, identities have to be recreated in more radical, uh, you know, austere and artificial forms as, you know, as a kind of compensation. And that's where you get ISIS and a lot of other things. Sam Huntington was right. Look at the MGI map yesterday, which James had, showing the center of gravity moving back towards the east. Yes, absolutely. Please. Yeah, um, the theme I want to put back on the table that I've heard at this forum and was interesting is uh, the issue of inequality and its intergenerational um, aspects. We've heard this morning uh, youth variously described as victims or villains. Um, and uh, really, it, it, it's a question, um, what can we do to bring back agency? Because I, I'm really feeling a sense of of fatalism in the face of a growing uh, youth population uh, that not going to have jobs. Uh, and we see already inequality testing uh, the very limits of our democratic societies. Don't go away from here depressed. Um, actually, when it comes to Europe, um, I'm cautiously optimistic because I think the EU will survive and, and the, what, the partial replacement will be what I said earlier about city-states and all of that. But In she's terms talking of about youth, youth and the next generation. Yeah. And, you know, and with youth, um, I think um, what's going to happen, one of the challenges is the information economy leads to, uh, you know, not everyone can adapt to it. It rewards certain people. Uh, you know, much better than others, and jobs have to be found. I, you know, because if, if you're not going to have jobs, you're going to have radical movements. But what do you say to the person who's got a first-class honors degree who can't get a job? Uh, I, that, th that leads to radicalism as well. I don't, I don't have a solution for that. I mean, that, you know, that is happening. It will happen. It has happened. All right. OK, what about the one big idea at this last moment, uh, Robert, before we uh, all depart, um, about the problem between departments and skills and, uh, and the, the challenges now of how to bring together government departments who are not talking to each other? We heard from the intelligence, uh, from the f uh, Belgian foreign minister, that intelligence departments are very good at gathering intelligence but not even sharing it with governments or within their own government? The, the, uh, this, the enormity and the scale and the depth of the change and, you know, which translates into disorder will need, means that national governments will be in a competition with each other to adapt. You know, it's almost like we know about human e the fight for human ingenuity among individuals. It will be human ingenuity about uh, between national governments in terms of which can bureaucratically reform and reduce vertical stove piping. Remember, the current U.S. system came about at the turn of the 20th century, particularly with the Teddy Roosevelt administration, when most of the government departments that we're familiar with now were first created in their current form. And the Gilded Age was a time of tremendous stress and change with tremendous inequalities. So, you know, the American system, the bureaucratic system, coped with that. It also coped at the end of World War II with the creation of NATO and men in the United Nations and other organizations. We're at that point where there has to be, a, you know, an, another uh, you, uh, an, uh, you know, another generation of institutional and bureaucratic change that I believe will go horizontal rather than vertical. All right, that's the message to take forward. We hope we've crystallized for you whatever thoughts, observations, analyses that you had uh, from wherever you've been in the last uh, 48 hours. Thank you to you for staying, to listen to this. Thank you, Karen, for inviting all of us to partake in this incredible brainstorming with the most wonderful attendees as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Nick and Robert for being our intellectual guides through the weekend and distilling the many ideas that were generated over the weekend. And Robert, you actually brought into the conversation my favorite philosopher, Isaiah Berlin. And as you were talking about Berlin and quoting various things from him, I was thinking about the wonderful essay he wrote about the fox and the hedgehog. And I thought, 
that could be our mascot <laughs> for Brussels Forum, because what we wanted to do over the weekend was give you a sampling through the plenary sessions, the night owls, that sort of fox-like. You scamper across a lot of territory and learn a little bit about a lot of subjects. But then through other formats, like the dinners, try to give a deeper dive uh, and burrow in the way the hedgehog does on, on certain subjects. And, I appreciated you uh, reminding me of that essay. Um, but you also, Robert, talked about the importance of history as context for the present. And that, of course, uh, was very much connecting the ending to the beginning with Margaret Macmillan. And I was really struck at the note she ended on, which is, yes, maybe we stumbled into a war in 1914, and maybe we could stumble into war in 2016. But she ended by saying, avoid complacency. So her point is that we do have agency. And let's think about the positive changes we've all experienced in our lifetimes. The Europe that we currently stand in was divided in our lifetimes, in my lifetime. And how did that change? because people took action, people like all of you. After World War II, it was people who said, we don't want that again, and we're gonna create a European community, which is today a European Union. If we care about that liberal international order that has been created since the end of World War II, it's on us. So I don't think there should be a fatalism about where we end but it is taking action and avoiding complacency. So that would be my, my note to end on. But to create Brussels Forum, it does take a village. And I think you've all seen that village at work over this weekend. We have an incredible set of partners who make this possible. And I wanna just, again, share with you who those partners are and give them thanks. We have our founding partners, Daimler and the Federal Authorities of Belgium. We have our strategic partner, Deloitte. We have our forum partners, Google, BP, the OCP Policy Center, UPS. We have our associate partners, the Assan Institute, Brussels Capital Region, the Latvian Ministry of Defense, NATO, and the Wilfried Martens Center. And as all of you enjoyed last night, we had lots of wonderful dinner sponsors who got us out across Brussels. And I also want to give a special note of thanks to our congressional delegation, Senator Shaheen, Senator Sessions, Congressman Turner. It was really great to have their voices in this election year in the United States. And as you know, I get to stand up here, but I'm representing an incredible group of colleagues at the German Marshall Fund and an equally incredible group of volunteers who have helped us throughout this weekend. And there are far too many people to mention, but I do want to mention two, and that is the incredible Nicola Leitner and our man on the ground, Ian Lesser, here in Brussels. <laughs> And on that note of gratitude to so many, and all of you in the room who took the time this weekend to be with us, uh, Brussels Forum 2016 is officially over. Thank you so much.